So, yes, um, we have this center, which is between uh, um, MIT and Harvard, but more importantly, bef between, uh, between uh, neuroscience, computer science, and cognitive science. We are primarily interested in the science of intelligence and also in the engineering, mainly to show that we understand the science. Um, and we would like to do research, um, kind of basic research required to develop systems then that can pass a kind of Turing test for vision, such as answering an open-ended set of questions that people can ask about images or videos. Questions that are more easier, like what is there, or who is there, face recognition, and more difficult ones, like questions about uh, um, feelings and social interactions, and uh, up to questions like, uh, um, tell me a story about this image, and uh, after that, you know, tell me why you told me this particular story, and so on. Now, I think asking what is intelligence is an ill-posed problem. There are too many possible answers to it. Um, you know, is a computer that can do integrals better than we do, and this exists since the 50s, is that intelligent or not? Uh, <coughs> but for human intelligence, we can ask the scientific question, what is human intelligence? This is really Turing's idea, but yeah, as we'll see, more than that, so human intelligence, uh, we can define it, we can study it, because we have people, we have subjects, we have uh, guinea pigs in principle. Um, and um, I believe, by the way, that human intelligence is one word, but many problems. It's like biology. Biology, you know, in the 1920, people spoke about uh, the secret of life, as if one could do one discovery, solve the problem of life. It is like today saying biology is one problem. You know, one Nobel Prize and that's solved. And I think intelligence is the same story, many problems. So in a sense, the mission of CBMM is trying to define these problems, answer them. We call them Turing++ plus plus question. They correspond to some of the questions you can ask about images and videos. Um, and we would like models that can answer this question. It's an open-ended set of questions, of course. Um, and we want to answer the, both at the performance level, computational, at the level of correlation with human behavior, the psychophysics, and also in models that tell us how these um, systems, these uh, processes that answer questions are implemented in terms of neural circuits. And so, um, really the, under, the hardware of the brain. Um, now, I'll speak very briefly about three things that are required, you know, there are kind of examples of work going on in the center about object recognition and action recognition and describing videos or images in natural language, describing what you have seen, answering, answering questions. Um, the first one is something I've been working on. It's uh, um, trying to explain what uh, the ventral stream in visual cortex is doing. The main hypothesis is that it's computing a representation of images which is invariant to transformations that the organism has experienced during its life, like geometric transformations such as translation or scale or rotations of objects and the reason for why invariance is important is because it can reduce very much the sample complexity of the learning problem of a classifier that uses this representation for object recognition. Um, the basic algorithm, the main attraction of the algorithm, there are many ways to compute invariant representation, invariant and selective. Um, the main um, attraction of this particular algorithm is uh, it's, it's elegant mathematically, but the main attraction is uh, that it, it maps very well in what the neurons in visual cortex 
can do and probably do. So let me describe the algorithm first. Uh, suppose you are a baby in the crib and you play with a toy, it's a bike, and so you transform it and you look at it. The only learning required is just unsupervised storing of what you see. So it's a movie. Suppose, just for simplicity, that you have rotation on the image plane. So you have now a little movie of this toy rotating. Okay, if you store this forever, and then when much later you see any image, in this case the image of a fish, and you want to compute a transformation, a, a, a description, a representation of it, which is invariant to what you have seen, to the transformation you have uh, stored, which is rotation, what you do is simply a dot product of the new image with each one of the frames. There are eight frames, you get, get eight numbers. Those eight numbers, the statement is these eight numbers are invariant to the transformation. In this case, rotation. You get the same eight numbers if um, instead of the fish oriented this way, it's oriented in a different way. Um, the same is true for scale and translation and a fine transformation in 2D. Um, the numbers are the same, uh, the order is in general different. So statistics like the histogram of the numbers are invariant. Um, and you can see this here if I compute the histogram of you know, the fish, um, of the value of the dot product of the fish against the bike, I get the right histogram that is invariant to rotation of the fish. I get the same histogram for different. This is, in this case, is translation instead of rotation, sorry. And the same for the cat. I, I get the blue histogram. And this representation is invariant, is also selective. I can distinguish between the cat and, um, the, and the fish. Um, how, in order to get selectivity, I need enough toys not just one template and transformation, but <coughs> enough of them. Um, they're generic. They can be anything. They don't need to be related to the new image. Um, fortunately, the number of templates I need, it depends only on the log of Im the number of images I have to distinguish. So it does not increase quickly. OK, this, this by the way, is one of the approach is this one of uh, uh, invariant representation that could um, help in uh, you know, this challenge that machine learning has of going beyond big data, but having algorithms that learn more like children do from not too many supervised labeled examples. OK. Uh, and by the way, as a parenthesis, I think we, we extended this uh, I theory to deal with the basic elements in deep learning networks, which are basically, there are two basic nonlinear operations in most of these uh, recent um, deep learning convolutional networks. One is the rectifier or sigmoid, and the other one is the um, convolutional and max out step. And um, so we can prove that um, both, both uh, layers, both the convolution or the, the, the rectifiers one are, can, be, can be, are equivalent to kernels. Um, let's see. As I mentioned before, this, this, this operation that corresponds to the convolutional and uh, um, layers, actually extend them, because in the neural networks you have the G is an element of the translation group only, but here it could be um, um, the whole group of a fine transformation and beyond that. Um, <coughs> this maps quite intriguingly well into what simple and complex cells can do in V1, in V1 and in other areas of uh, visual cortex. So, but let me skip this in the interest of time. And let me go to the next example, which has to do with um, experiments on object recognitions and action recognition. 
So this is work done by uh, Leila Isaac, uh, a student now a postdoc in the center, using MEG that measure activity in the brain um, by measuring the changes in magnetic fields induced by electrical activity. Um, and here you can um, um, record activity while a subject is looking at images and um, decode this activity using, for instance, a, a classifier and um, predict what the subject has been seeing, for instance, um, identity of the images. And the interesting part of this technique is that unlike fMRI, um, it's a very, has a very high accuracy in time, down to one millisecond. So in fMRI, the time constant is around one second because it's dictated by the dynamics of the blood and blood flow. Um, but here, e the, the time resolution is very good. And so if you are a computational scientist, you're not so interested in exactly where something is happening in the brain. You're more interested in which routines or processes, what is the sequence, the program that is running. And so uh, by using these techniques, you can see that there is uh, um, information about the identity of the images coming at about 80 milliseconds after onset of, of the image, um, which is consistent with data um, saying that there is, uh, um, it takes 80 milliseconds for information to go from the eye to the higher part of visual cortex, infratemporal cortex. And uh, you can also, these techniques measure uh, when this representation is invariant to position and scale. And uh, um, it turns out that um, the position invariant representation that you measure takes longer to develop than the position, uh, the non invariant representation, consistent with the idea that you build invariance through a step, series of steps, like in convolutional layer up in visual cortex. Um, you can use, uh, uh, and here you see, actually you see that you, you first get invariant to small translation and uh, small shifts and then it takes a longer time for invariance to larger scale changes and larger position changes um, consistent with the idea that you get more and more invariance you, as you go uh, layer after layer areas after areas in visual cortex yes how do you measure this invariance how do you know that something so you train a classifier on the neural activity that you measure for objects, say, at a certain size. Then you measure the activity induced by objects at different size and see whether the previously trained classifier is able to decode that or not. If it is able to do it, the representation has to be invariant. Um, you can do the same for action recognition. So this is a recent and published work. And you can check um, so some basic uh, five types of uh, actions in this case, like running, eating, uh, jumping. Uh, and you lo can look at invariance for viewpoint and speed, for instance. Um, and you, y again, you find that there is uh, um, um, it takes about 200 milliseconds, which should be something like five or six frames for the representation to be invariant to actor identity, to the identity of who is performing the action, and about the same time for invariant to viewpoints, for instance. Um, okay, so that's another example. And uh, um, I'm finishing now. I have about five minutes, 10 minutes. Yeah. So. Uh, with 
the, the final more the higher level one of the, you know describing what happens in the video and this is work by the organizer of this session I think <laughs> and uh, um, uh, have to do with describing in, in language what happens in a video and um, uh, here we don't have right now uh, the, the neural correlates of this so it's uh, still at the stage of algorithms and uh, models of that um, but for instance you can ask about this image um, who was given the yellow lemon and um, you see here Danny and, uh, and Andre and just from this image I don't think it's uh, possible to answer the question <laughs> but there is a video exactly so the video So now you can answer the question, right? Um, and um, and so the system can answer the question from the video, and uh, it, it, it's you know this problem of um, using video to disambiguate vision and vice versa is. Uh, um, an interesting one for which there is an implementation that can uh, do this. Um, here is another example of. Uh, see, should work. So, um, um, he, here again, uh, you can combine vision and language to make sense of what's going on. You can say exactly what, uh, what happens. There are two different interpretations for that yep. sentence. Two short videos. Right. So Right. It is not clear whether the man approached the chair that has the bag or the man was carrying the chair, uh, carrying the bag towards the chair. You just read this. And, uh, um, you know, the ultimate goal, this is back to the Turing++ plus plus question, um, is really to have a system that can answer questions about images, videos like this, can um, um, answering queries about it, can generate a narrative, ideally can explain how it generated narrative. And uh, even more ambitiously, it, it connects that to to what is going on in the, the human brain when, when a person does all of this. That uh, that's, um, will require quite a, a bit of time, probably beyond the 10 years of the center, but um, um, we are starting this and we'll, uh, we hope we'll make significant progress on, on it. Um, thank you.